We're going to look at some pillars today. A Bible study on pillars. Pillars of our faith, our covenant with the Father and the Son. And uh, pillars show up a lot of times in the Bible. I was, um, there's a th common thread that goes along. And there's two kinds of pillars. There's a, just like so many other things. There's the good pillars and there's the bad pillars. Let's uh, begin our study today in Genesis chapter 28. And you know the story here. The story begins with prayer. Shall we pause? Thank you, Father, for giving us your word. These important lessons that you have given to us that we may learn of you, learn of your ways. And this morning we ask that your spirit be here to guide us into an understanding, a better understanding of yourself and your son who is your representative. We ask this in his name. Amen. Uh, Roberto, I thank you for pointing out a little appreciation of just how old Jacob was. He wasn't just a young boy. Um, in, in knowing how old he ultimately lived, he's past middle age. <laughs> Seventy years old. And uh, he's on the run. Uh, he's tired. He's exhausted. He's alone. And he collapses. He falls down on the ground. Rock for a pillow. And he goes to sleep. He dreams a dream. And of course, you remember the dream he dreamed, right? He sees a Ladder stretching from earth to heaven. And on the ladder, going up and down on the ladder, are angels. They're bringing blessings from the Father. They're carrying back prayers, petitions, pleas from his children here on the earth. And Jacob wakes up. This is very reassuring to him. There's a connection. He is not alone. He thought he was alone. Is he alone? No, he's not alone. And let's start in verse 16. Jacob awoke out of sleep. And he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Right? That's where that song comes from. And he says, I knew it not. How often do we just carry on oblivious or at least, you know, distracted? Because there's so many things that we have to do each day. There's all these demands on us and unaware that there is someone very close to us. And he was afraid, and he said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Heaven's gate. <laughs> that was in the news a few years ago. And Jacob arose up early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put for his pillows, and he set it up. Now, this must have been a pretty big stone, I would imagine, for a pillar, big enough to be considered a pillar. And look what he does. He pours oil upon the top of it. What is he doing to this pillar? Anointing the pillar. Why do we anoint? What do we anoint? We anoint prophets, priests, and kings. They're all anointed, aren't they? He's anointing this pillar. Why? It's going to be set apart. It's going to be... Uh, sanctified. It's going to be a remembrance of a holy, special occasion. God came into his life and spoke to him. And uh, he sets it up and he calls the name of it, the, this place, Bethel. Huh, that means house of God. Beth is a house. Bet, Beth's house. El God. And the name of the city there originally was Luz, but now it's known as Bethel, the house of God. And Jacob vowed a vow. You'll no notice this. This happens over and over with pillars. 
there's a covenant going to be made. God has spoke to him. He reaffirms the promise through his great-grandfather, his grandfather Abraham, and to Isaac, and to Jacob, that the land, this is going to be their land, and to their seed, if he says, here's the vow, if God will be with me and keep me in the way that I'm going to go and he's going to keep me fed and keep clothes on my body, he's going to get me safely back to my father's house in peace. Very important there. Part of it, isn't it? Then what? Then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. Well, Jacob goes on. He's just started a long journey to Laban's, his uh, mother's family. And this is Uncle Laban. He's in Mesopotamia. So he's got a, he's got a way to go. He finally gets there, and of course uh, he, as uh, many of these patriarchs did, Moses... Uh, Jacob, uh, Eleazar for Isaac. They all had something to do with watering camels <laughs> and a sheep or something at the well and they're watering. Anyway, he uh, finds Rebecca. It's love at first sight. Uh, he thinks he's going to get her after se he agrees to seven years of labor for, uh, for this child of Laban. And it's one of his distant relatives. And he is, he is tricked. Seven years more he has to work for, before he finally gets, or he uh, pays for Rebecca. He gets her, but he gets Leah first. So he's 77. And now he's 77. It's actually 84. Right? Seven plus seven years. Fourteen years he works for both of those. And now one day he says, you know, your father, he's talking to Rachel and Leah, your father has changed my wages ten times. And they said, yeah, we've had enough of him too. Let's get out of here. So while he's out shearing the sheep, they make a run for it. They get seven days down the road and Laban <laughs> discovers what's happening. He catches up with them. And uh, let's turn to 31, chapter 31. We'll go over two chapters. Genesis 31. And in verse 45, we see here what happens. Let's start with 44. We get a running start. Now therefore come thou, this is Laban speaking to Jacob, let us make a covenant, I and you, let it be for a witness between me and thee. And they're going to do something very similar to what Jacob did back there at the ladder dream, setting up a pillar. And Jacob took a stone, verse 45, and he set it up for a pillar. And Jacob said unto his brethren, get stones, gather stones. And they took stones and they made a heap and they did eat there upon the heap. And Laban called it <laughs> Jegasaradutha. But Jacob called it Galil. I, th I like Jacob's name. Well, it's a lot easier. Galil means a heap. And uh, Laban said, This heap is a witness between me and thee this day. Therefore was the name of it called Galil. And Mitzpah. Now that's the way you should pronounce it. We often say Mizpah. But that's because we don't have a TZ letter in the English language. But in Hebrew there is. The uh, Tzadik. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a. and uh, so it should be uh, mitz mitz mitzpah. Now, there's a the meaning of this just means something. It's a high point where you have an a vantage point where you can look out and you can see an overlook, uh, a, a watchtower, a lookout. That's what I found out looking this up. Now, it has been assumed that it means, may the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from another. Because this is what Laban said. Yes. And there is a, actually, I, I've discovered there's a line of jewelry that's called mitzvah jewelry. It's kind of keepsakes. 
You know, I'll give you this to remember me while we're absent one from another. They call it mitzvah jewelry. But uh, actually it means uh, to see, to look out, a prominent high point where you can see over the area. But they're, they're actually making a, um, a covenant here between them, right? Isn't that what he said back there in verse 44? And he said, if you shall afflict my daughters and you take other wives, then I'm after you. I'm going to come at you. This stone will not stand in my way. But if you, as long as you're true to them and you treat them, I will not bother you. And furthermore, I don't want you coming back and getting more of my cattle. <laughs> I changed your, your salary, your wages ten times and every time you kept getting more and more. So <laughs> I'm kind of glad you're leaving. But don't you come back into my territory. That's what this stone was. It was a boundary stone. I won't come bother you if you don't come bother me. That's really what they were saying here. And they offered sacrifices there and, and um, made this covenant on the pillar. Now, uh, as you, the story goes on, and uh, Esau is now coming. They're getting closer back to his own, own home. And he hears that Esau is coming. He, he wrestles with the angel of the Lord uh, all night, you know, all that. And then uh, they, they make peace. They come, he comes back into the land. They're in Canaan again. And uh, Dinah daughter of Jacob, is um, not treated properly by some men from Shechem. And he, after the fact, comes and says, may I marry your daughter? The deed had already been done. And Levi and Simeon weren't too keen on this, and they wanted revenge, and so they said, fine, as long as you become like us. And they did, and they were sore, and in the midst of their Soreness, they wiped them out. And Jacob says, you have made a stink come up on our name because of your... Yes. And uh, so then something happened. Let's go to chapter 35. We'll take up the end of that story. We're, we're, we're on a path to the pillars. And in uh, chapter 35, verse 10... Well, no, no, before that. Verse 9. And God appeared to Jacob again when he came out of um, Padan Aram, and he blessed him, and he said, Your name, Jacob, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Now he got a name change. For Israel shall be how you shall be called. The second time. Because he was given that when he wrestled with the angel. But he's reaffirming it here, and he says, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. And he's the same thing again, kings are going to come out of you. And the land that I uh, gave to Abraham and Isaac, I'm going to give it to you, and your seed after you. And God went up before him, verse 14. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone. Now, where are they? We have to go back to verse 3. After this thing had happened with Dinah and all, he says, let's rise and go to Bethel. Actually, uh, God appeared to him in verse 1 and said, um, put away the strain. No, uh, told God in verse 1, rise and go to Bethel. He was instructed to go to Bethel. So he tells everybody, put all the idols, clean up house here. We've, we're going to go back to the house of God. And they're going to go back to where they begin, where he began. This was his encounter with God at Bethel. He's gone away. He's got his family. They've grown into a large group now. They've come back. He's going back to Bethel. And uh, he gets there. In verse 14, he sets up a pillar, even a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil on, on this stone again, just like he did the first time. Oil. He's anointing this stone. And he's, because God has reconfirmed his covenant with him. So he is reconfirming it by anointing the stone again. There's something about pillars and covenants. And uh, especially so with Jacob here. Twice now. Well, time goes on. You know that uh, famine comes in the land. The, the brothers are jealous of Joseph. They sell him to the uh, Ishmaelites, their cousins. They haul him off down to Egypt. Uh, famine gets uh, actually 
Uh, there's seven years of plenty. Jacob interprets the dream for Pharaoh. They uh, save up all the food. And then the years of famine hit, the seven years of famine. Now the brothers and Jacob back up in Canaan said, I hear there's food in Egypt. Somebody go down and get some food. We're going to starve to death. And you know the story of Joseph. The time eventually came after they all moved down to Egypt. They grew into a mighty nation. A pharaoh rose did not know Joseph. And it was time for God to redeem his people out of Egypt. This is a prelude. It's a, fort. It's a type of what he's going to ultimately do with us out of this world. He's going to come and save us out of this world, uh, out of Egypt. And so, how does he do this? Let's uh, go to Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13. And in verse 21, the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud. Here's another pillar. Now, the pillars so far with Jacob have been important encounters with God. And this is no less. Now God is in the pillar. It's a pillar of cloud. And by night, a pillar of fire to give them light. Then if we go to chapter 14, we find out something, a little more information. Chapter 14, next chapter, verse 19. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went before their face and stood behind them. So wherever the angel of the Lord went, the pillar went. The angel, later on we'll see that the angel of the Lord speaks out of the pillar. And Paul tells us that they uh, were baptized in the sea and the rock that followed them was Christ. He was this angel of the Lord. He was the representative of the Father. Followed them throughout their wilderness wanderings. They, are, they leave Egypt with mighty, in a mighty hand, right? God says with all these displays of his power, the, uh, the judgments, the plagues, and they come into Canaan. And they live happily ever after, right? No. It's up and down, up and down. They're serving the gods of the Canaanites. And uh, God can't bless them. And their enemies come in. And then they cry to God. And he raises up a judge. And they fight them off. And there's peace in the land for 40 years or so. And then this goes on and on and on. All through the time of the judges. Finally they said, we're tired of we want a king like everybody else. So then they go into the time of the kings. And it's up and down. You have a good king who follows the Lord in all his ways. And then you have a bad king. Who's worse than the one before him. And... Let's look at two of the good kings. Now, we talked about this in Sabbath school last, uh, last week. And I kept getting them mixed up, but I figured out a way to get them straightened out. Joash and Josiah. Both good kings, right? Who's who and which is, which, who's on first? The shorter name, and also alphabetically, is Joash. J-O-A, and then later comes J-O-S. And it's a longer name, too. And the younger king, he's seven years old when Joash comes uh, to be king. He's hidden in the temple for seven years. He's the grandson of Athaliah. She kills all the other grandsons off and she thinks she's got them all taken care of. But one's hidden away in the temple by the high priest, Jehoiada. And he brings him out in the seventh year and they blow the trumpets and Athaliah comes in and says, treason, treason. She rips her robes. And we were thinking last night, if Athaliah, the daughter of Jezebel, Jezebel was a priestess of Baal, right? I'll bet Athaliah was a priestess as well. Like mother, like daughter. She's the daughter of the... <laughs> what happens when the priest rips his robes? We, remember we talked about that as well. Uh, remember Caiaphas? Caiaphas? He invalidated his, high, his office. No longer high priest. So she rips her, and she says, treason, treason. Well, that's okay. She's no longer, uh, she's the one that's in treason, and they haul her off. But look what happens in both of these two good kings. Joash, the priest, and Josiah.
Christ came, the first thing is death and sorrow. Three words in the Bible. The first thing is death and sorrow. Verse 16. And his son is gone, and he told you the story very carefully. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Second <laughs> uh, Kings 11. 7, 11. They're, they're both lucky numbers. We'll come back to chapter 7 in 1 Kings. But let's go to chapter 11. Chapter 11. First is 2 Kings. 2 Kings 11. I, I, am, I got some of these things in just not quite the right order. 2 Kings 11. There's Athaliah. Yep, she did all that stuff. And they came out. Sure enough, there's the captains. And they haul her off. And uh, so... Down in, where is this? Before? Right. Hmm? before? Yes, the pillar. Who's before? Oh, and in the seventh year of Jehoiada, you can't catch them all. Come on. These things round about. And, uh, and, they're on the, and they brought forth the king's son. Verse 12. And they put a crown on him and gave him the testimony. What's the testimony? And they made him king and anointed him and they clapped their hands and they said, God save the king. So that's where that comes from. And then Athaliah comes in. She hears the noise. And uh, when she looked, verse 14, behold the king, this young little king, seven years old, how, how tall, I mean, he's just a little thing. And he's got the crown on, and she's, she knows, oh, oh, I missed one of them. <laughs> and he stood by a pillar, as the manner was. Now, when you compare this account in Second Chronicles, chapter 23, 13, it says, the king stood at his pillar at the entering in of the temple. And this is where I was going to... We'll go back now. First Kings, chapter 7, it's talking about building Solomon's temple. And... In verse 21, he names these two great pillars that they put, that Solomon put at the beginning, at the entrance to the temple. They were 18 cubits high. They were made out of brass. One on the right was called Yakin, and the one on the left was called Boaz. Now you read, when you look in Hebrew, you read from what? Right to left. So if you're standing out and looking at the temple and the one on your right would be Yakin, right? And then I got it backwards. I'm trying to think <laughs> the way you're looking at it. Okay, your Yakin would be on the right and Boaz would be on the left. But you read from right to left. And so Yakin means he has established, or Yahweh, Yah, Yahkin, has established, has set up, has, and it means uh, with permanence. It's a, like a foundation. And then Boaz, B is in, and I, I guess as is strength, because I said it means in strength. He has established in strength. His temple is established. He has established his temple in strength. So, now, which, which is, what are these two? Some say one represented David, who established the temple. All, he established the temple, and Solomon built it in his strength. I kind of think it's the other way around. That Solomon established the temple, that his father, in his strength, he's the one that collected all the materials, made it, made it possible. He got all the timber from Lebanon. He got all the gold from Ophir and from all these different kings that supplied all these uh, materials. There was there's the strength of the building, all the great stones. Are, Solomon built it. He gave the plans to him. And we see... 
Saul, and David's the father, Solomon's the son, which are a type of the father and the son. Isn't it uh, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9, that God, the Father, created all things by Jesus Christ, His Son. And we see that in a number of places in Scripture. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. Who has established the ends of the earth? What is His name? And what is His Son's name, if you can tell? Now, what is His name? Yaquim. He is the one who established the earth. And what is His Son's name? He is the power and the wisdom of God, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. Jesus Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Did I get, it's the wisdom of God and the power of God. <laughs> get the right order. And that's the two pillars of the church. Two pillars, yeah. Well, we're, we're, we're going to look at some pillars here. Um, so that was Joash. He stood by the pillar, and it was his pillar, it tells us in Second Chronicles. And Athaliah saw it, and she says, uh-oh. It's it's this is what the kings did. When the kings came to power, and it, usually it's the, the son of the king, so the father's pillar and the son's pillar. The son would take his position by the, the son's pillar, and he's sworn into office, He's, the testimony is read, the covenant is made, you're going to be king of Israel and you're going to follow Yahweh and all, and all his commandments and his statutes and you're going to, you know, yes, you know, raise your hand. She sees this happening. It's all set up for the occasion. Okay, now let's look at Josiah. Same thing happened there, Second Kings uh, 22. So we, we're, here we are in 1 Kings 11. 11 and 11 is 22. We've got to go to 2 Kings 22. 2 Kings 22. This is good King Joash. He's eight years old when he comes to be king. And uh, verses 1 through 3. He did that which was right in the sight of God, walked in all the ways of David his father, turned not to the right or the left hand, and it came to pass in the 18th year of Josiah. He made a discovery. Actually, someone else made a discovery. They were cleaning out the temple. And they found in there, in the house, a scribe in the house, found this book of the law. And, okay, and then we go to uh, chapter 23. And you, I'm going to go through this very quickly. You know the story. He finds this. He, he has it read to them. Hilkiah reads it to him. And... He rends his clothes. And he says, we have fallen far, far away. Why? Who's Josiah? Who was his father? We just said this in Sabbath school lesson last week. Manasseh. Good king Manasseh. Like father, like son. The worst king that probably ever was. And... Josiah realized how far they were from God. After reading, hearing the law, this is what they should be. We've got a work to do. And so in chapter 23, the king sent and he gathered into him all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. The king went into the house of the Lord and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem went with him. The priests and the prophets and all the people. Small. Manasseh was his grandfather. Yes, oh, oh the cave. Okay, it was close though. <laughs> Amon, yes, Amon. Yeah, he only lasted two years. That's right, grandfather. And so all these people came in there and he's going to hear the book of the covenant. There's a covenant here, which was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by a pillar. Which pillar do you think he stood by? The king's pillar, the son's pillar. And made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord, keep His commandments and His testimonies and His statutes with all His heart, with all their soul, and perform the words of the covenant written in this book. So there is, every time you see the stone being raised up, we talked about uh, Jacob, raised up stone and called it Bethel, anointed it twice. And made a God made a covenant with him each time. And he made a covenant with God. And now, here, here's two kings, Josiah and Joash. Joash and Josiah. Let's get them right. <laughs> get them in right order. And they both stood by a pillar. 
and there's both a covenant being made each time. Now, what is it about the pillars in the house? Let's go to the New Testament. 1 Timothy 3, verse 15. I'm going to try to pull this together here real quick. 1 Timothy 3.15. Now, 3.16, we're all familiar with. Whoops. Did I get the right one? Three. 1 Timothy 3. Yes. 1 Timothy 3.16. We, we quote that a lot. We're very familiar with that. Let's look at verse 15. If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God. We're talking about the, how, how to conduct ourselves in the house of God. Where did we hear about the house of God? What's the house of God? It had a name, Bethel, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The ground of the truth. Who is the truth? Jesus, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. And then the church is built on him, right? No other... Other foundation can not any man made than is made uh, in Christ Jesus. He is the cornerstone, the stone with the builders rejected. Let's uh, look one more pillar in the Old Testament. I should have mentioned this back when we were talking about pillars, Bethel, but uh, when Jacob set up this pillar, let's turn to Proverbs. How many pillars? We, we saw two. Uh, Solomon had two pillars at the beginning. We heard, we saw what their names were. In Proverbs chapter nine. Oh man, here we go. Proverbs chapter nine, verse one. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. There's seven pillars in Wisdom's house. Now, this is really right on the heels of chapter 8. And chapter 8 is all about wisdom. It starts out, it's a kind of an allegorical um, personification of wisdom, but it becomes very personal. It becomes personalized. It becomes literalized. It talks about... Uh, the one who is with the Lord from everlasting, from before the world ever was. And he was set up. It was set up. I was set up from everlasting. Verse 23. And it ends in verse 34, near the end of the chapter 8. Blessed is the man that hears me and watches daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors the pillars of my doors. And then it goes on. And really, chapter 9 is just a continuation of this. It really probably shouldn't be a separation of chapters there. It's all part of the same message. Wisdom, who was with the Father, when the, and it goes all through the, uh, the seas and the mountains and foundations, and when he appointed the foundations of the earth and so on. It's talking about creation. He is there. And he now is setting up pillars. He was set up in the beginning of, his, of the Father's way from the foundation of the earth, from, from everlasting. Now he is going to set up seven pillars and build his house. Doesn't Peter tell us that? First Peter chapter 1, he says uh, that we are lively stones built up a spiritual house a holy priesthood offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ so we are pillars are we pillars and um, he is going to make seven pillars in his house he says now something happens to the pillars oh let's Let's see this here. See if this will come up. We have a little uh, animation here of the pillar. Sabbath, creation, loyalty of the law, the sanctuary. Slow, soul sleep is a little 
sure, judgment, the second coming. These are the basic pillars upon which uh, the Adventist church, the pioneers, discovered in Bible study. And the foundation, as you can see, is the sun. It's on Christ of which all of this is built. I couldn't get it to stop right at that point, so the only way I could do it is to have it rewind to the first part of the slide. But let's look at these seven. Uh, the sun is all of this, isn't he? He is all of these. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. When, you know, he said, uh, Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Mark 2.24 And he is Creator. And we just mentioned a couple, one of the verses, but there are many more. Hebrews 1, chapter 2, God, who in these last times spoken to us by His Son, by whom also He made the worlds. By the Word of the Lord. Who's the Word of the Lord? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. By the Word of the Lord were the heavens made. Psalm 33, verse 6. And so He's Creator, Lawgiver. And that's our loyalty to the Father is through keeping His commandments. Jesus says, I have kept my Father's commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Is the Son's commandments different from the Father's commandments? The same commandments. He spoke the law from Mount Sinai. I think we had a whole study on that before as well. He's the lawgiver. Mediator. We have Hebrews. Oh, we're right here. Peter... James, Hebrews, chapter 8 is one of my favorite ones. Now, this is some of the, we have spoken. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister, a high priest, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. This tabernacle was not made with human hands, not made with hands. He is in the heavenly sanctuary and he is our mediator. Between the Father. We, if any man sin, we have an advocate, which is the same word used as comforter in John chapter 14. He's our redeemer. He's the one who's going to raise those who sleep in the dust. Right? Awake, awake ye that sleep in the dust. Isaiah chapter 26. And um, we know that uh, this is going to happen at the second coming. We're going to have a resurrection. And Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 25, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. And they that hear shall live. And they're going to come forth the great right? The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. They're going to hear... That's, that's the shout that's going to raise the, what is it, the living dead? What's the, what's the expression we usually use? That'll, that'll raise the, that's so loud it would raise the living dead. <laughs> okay, judgment. Um, he is the judge. He says here, the father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the son. And because he is the son of man, he has authority from him, given to him, authority to execute judgment. Verse 26, John chapter 5. And of course, the second coming, he's coming as King of kings, Lord of lords. So he is all of these things. He is the pillars. But we also have those become part of our experience as well. And the big promises, one of the best promises in the Bible... Revelation chapter 3, you know, is seven churches. And each one of them are a candlestick. Right? There were seven candlesticks. Jesus walking among them. And he says, these are the seven churches. Seven pillars. And uh, to the church of Philadelphia, to the church of brotherly love, the promise is given. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more, and I will write upon him the name of my God. Now, I wrote a song, new song this week. Uh, we're going to sing it right now. We've, we've been looking at pillars, 
and hell, these have all been associated with covenants, promises that God made with his people and promises that we make with him to stay loyal to him, to, be, to walk in his ways and to honor him. And he says, if you overcome, I will make you a pillar. I will make you a pillar in the house of my God. What, which house is this? The house of God in Bethel. Is there a heavenly Bethel? Amen. Where Jesus is the high priest? He's going to take those robes of the high priest off one of these days. And he's going to put on kingly robes. And he will come to receive us unto himself, that where he is, we may be also. And he will give to those who overcome to be pillars in, his, in the house of his God. Well, I wrote a song, and here's the words. And uh, uh, we're going to play the music here, and uh, we're going to try to sing this song. You haven't heard it before, but I'll, I'll show you. We're going to sing it twice. Let's turn it up a little louder. Who that overcometh will I make a pillar in the land. He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the another part of the story which we'll have at another time about what happens to the pillars. You know, some people aren't happy with the pillars and they think, I've got a better pillar than the one that's there. I think I can put a, a nicer pillar in, than the one. Oh, well, replacement pillar. Well, that's, another, <laughs> that's another, another story and there's a lot of texts and stories in the Bible that talk about that as well. But uh, today, let's end on a positive note. We can be pillars in the house of our, in our Father's house. Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you for this great promise that you have made through your Son to make us pillars in your house, that we can follow him wherever he goes, that we will be happy to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord 
to sing your praise for eternity. We want to overcome. We know that we cannot do it in ourselves. We ask that you give us your spirit, the spirit of your son, into our hearts to cleanse our temples as he cleansed the temple of old twice in Jerusalem. But he can cleanse us. May we give all that we have, put every effort we have into cooperating with you and let you do a work in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Truly.